Well, Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I must say I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm very grateful to the Nobel Committee for arranging this day because I think that it's a very important day. And given, and let's not forget, the title that they have given to this conference, The Conflicts of the 20th Century and the Solutions for the 21st Century. Throughout the 20th century, the Nobel Committee has spent a very positive time rewarding peace in different parts of the world, but by so doing, strengthening, as I know from my own experience, the peace process there. Because when we, David and I, received the awards from the Nobel Committee, I made very clear that we didn't just see it as awards to ourselves. We saw it as a clear statement of sympathy to the people of Northern Ireland for all they had suffered and a statement of strong support for the peace process. And it, there's no doubt that that did strengthen the peace process on the streets. And I think, therefore, given the enormous influence and respect that the Nobel Committee now has, and given that the Nobel Committee was born in the first year of the last century, now that we're in the first year of the new century and the new millennium, based on their experience and on the experience that they can draw from the representatives of areas of conflict that have been resolved in different parts of the world by bringing together representatives of peace, that in the new century they can become a major force in creating peace by sending the philosophy of peace that you can learn from the experience of all the people here to areas of conflict. Because when you look at areas of conflict, as those of us who have lived in them have done across the world, although this doesn't seem correct, it is very correct, that it, the, the vast majority of conflicts in the world are about the same thing. They're about difference. Whether difference is your religion or your nationality, or your race? And the answer is the same, one which we always use, that difference is an accident of birth. It's a very simple message to put across, but when you keep putting across to a community, it eventually gets through. And that since difference is an accident of birth, one could have been born into the other community. There's not two people in the whole world who are the same. Difference is of the essence of humanity. Therefore, difference is not something that one should fight about. It's something that we should respect. And in my intention today in the short speech I'm making, of course, is to deal with my own experience of a peace process, to look at the principles behind our agreement and our peace creation, and to see whether they can apply to and help other areas of conflict. And in so doing, to deal with the uh, title that this section of the conference has, which is, of course, rivalry over territory and resources, which is at the heart of our problem, and promote economic integration and free trade, which is at the heart of our proposed solution. Uh, when you look at our situation in the northern part of Ireland, our quarrel has gone on for 300 years. And indeed, starting way back in 1689, the siege in my own city. And the last 30 years have in many ways been the worst. One out of 500 people lost their lives. One out of 50 was killed and murdered. That's the equivalent here in Norway of 10,000 people being killed in percentage terms and 100,000 people being named or injured. And that shows you how serious our problem was. And not only that, but it was necessary in our major city of Belfast to build a large number of walls in the highest church-going city of both sections of Christianity, I think not only in Europe, but maybe in the world, necessary to build walls to protect one section from another. I always argued that those walls were an indictment of us all because what they represented, was our, what they were built by, was our past attitudes. An effort to look at them positively for a change, that they were a challenge to all of us to change those past attitudes. And when you look at our past attitudes, you find two mentalities there on both sides of our community which exist in many areas of conflict. 
the unionist people. And they're called unionist because, first of all, they are largely speaking the Protestant people. And our quarrel is not really about religion, although it is described as being about that. The Protestant people regard themselves as British. And they're called unionists because union with Britain is their political policy. And the Catholic people are called nationalists because they wish to be Irish and they wish Ireland to be one country. So the quarrel is about identity and not about religion. And when you look at the Protestant or the unionist mindset, being in Northern Ireland, they wish to, and they rightly wish, and their objective is totally correct. They wish to protect and preserve their identity and their ethos. And they're totally correct in that, in my opinion, because every society is richer for its diversity and communities are entitled to their culture and their identity. What was wrong in the past was their methodology. And that was a challenge, that the way to protect themselves was to hold all power in their own hands and exclude anybody who wasn't one of them. That led to widespread discrimination in housing, in jobs, and in voting rights. The challenge to that mindset was, look, that's bound to lead to conflict. So, but the real way to protect your identity is that because of your geography and your numbers, the problem can't be solved without you. Therefore, come to a table and reach an agreement that will protect your identity forever. That's what they did under the leadership of David. And then, of course, there was the nationalist mindset, the community from which I come, which I have called a territorial mindset. Ireland is our land. You unionists are a minority, so you can't stop us uniting. My challenge to that mindset was, hold on a minute. It's people that have rights, not territory. Without people, even Ireland is only a jungle. And when people are divided, they can only be brought together by agreement. And they certainly can't be brought together by guns and bombs. And as you're probably aware, there's a very long tradition of guns and bombs in Ireland. What do guns and bombs do? And this applies to any area of conflict where you've divided people. What do they do? They deepen the divisions and make the problem much more difficult to solve. And when one side uses them, the other side replies. What Mahatma Gandhi called the old doctrine of an eye for an eye, which leaves everybody blind. Mm -hmm. And so the change to that mindset had to be as well. It's people who are divided. It's agreement and solution. Therefore, lay down your guns and your bombs and come to the table and reach an agreement. And that's, in the end, what happened. And, of course, uh, when you look at how we did it and the principles behind it, I think they're worth looking at to see if they can be of any benefit to other areas of conflict. And I have to admit, excuse me a minute, that I was personally, as a political leader, very heavily influenced in my approach to this problem by my European experience. I often tell the story that when I first went to Strasbourg in 1979 as a member of the European Parliament, I decided to go for a walk to see where I was. And I walked across the bridge from Strasbourg in France to Kiel in Germany. And I stopped in the middle of the bridge and I meditated. And I said to myself, good Lord, if I had stood in this bridge 30 years ago at the end of the Second World War, 35 million people dead for the second time in a century. The worst period in the history of the world in terms of the slaughter of human beings. And if I had said then in 1949, four years after, don't worry, in not too many years, it's all over. And those peoples will be all together in a united Europe. I thought I would have been sent to a psychiatrist if I'd said it then. But it happened, and it's the duty of everyone seeking peace in areas of conflict to study how it happened. Because when you think of it, European Union is the best example in the history of the world of conflict resolution. When you consider the wars and conflicts of those peoples down the centuries, 
And unfortunately, that's not very much mentioned about European Union. What's often mentioned is it's a European economic community, which it is. But I'll come to that. And when you look at the principles that go to the heart of it, which you must, I think those are principles which will help any area of conflict. And the principles at the heart of the European Union are exactly the same principles at the heart of our agreement in Northern Ireland. Principle number one, respect for difference among the peoples of Europe. No victory for either side, total respect for their differences. Number two, institutions which respect those differences. A council of ministers, one from every country. A European commission, civil servants, all drawn from every country. A European parliament, drawn from every country. And the third principle, and the most important principle of all, working together in their common interests, which, to get back to our title, promoting economic integration and free trade, working the common ground, working the areas of agreement, not the areas of disagreement, or as I put it in populist terms to the people, spilling our sweat and not our blood for our country and our people. And as you do that together, as they did that in Europe, the new Europe evolved and is still evolving. And they have broken down the barriers of distrust of centuries. Now look at our agreement in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement as it's called. Principle number one, respect for difference. No victory for either side. The total identity of the unionist people is totally respected in our agreement, as is the total identity of the nationalist people. The second principle, institutions which respect those differences. An assembly elected in Northern Ireland by a proportional system of voting, which means that every section of the community is represented. If, you get 10, if your party gets 10% of the votes, it gets 10% of the seats. And then that assembly proportionally elects a government called an executive by a system of proportionality so that all sections of the people are there. And it is led by David, who is the first minister. And that means that now those, and the other institutions, of course, again, modeled on Europe, a council of Ireland, a North-South Council, representing both the northern and southern governments to work in areas of common concern, backed up by a north-south secretariat. A British-Irish council, because in dealing with the problem, we got down to making clear that the problem wasn't just a simple Northern Ireland problem. It was about their relationships with one another in Northern Ireland, their relationships with the rest of Ireland, and their relationships with Britain the two identity factors. And those three relationships were the agenda at our talks. And we reached agreement on all of those three, modeled on the European, British, Irish Council of Ministers, North South Council of Ministers, and an executive drawn from all sections of our community. And those, and now the th those institutions are now in place. And the third principle is now underway, which is work together in our common interests in real politics, not waving flags at one another. Because I never forget my first political lesson when I was 10 years old. And the Nationalist Party were holding an election meeting at the top of the street and waving their flags. And my father, who was unemployed, saw that I was getting emotional too. And he put his hand on my shoulder. He says, don't get involved in that stuff, son. And I says, why not, Dad? He says, you can't eat a flag. Think of the wisdom of that, that real politics shouldn't be about waving flags. It should be about developing the standard of living of all sections of your people. And that's common ground because both sections need that. And now our people have started working together through their representatives, spilling their sweat, not their blood. And I look forward, that is what I call the healing process. As they work together, break down the barriers of the past, the distrust of the past, and a new society in Ireland, north and south, will evolve. But it will not give victory to either side. It will be based on agreement and respect for difference. And the fourth principle, of course, 
of that agreement, which again followed the example of uh, Europe and is very important, was that the last word once the agreement was reached wasn't with the politician, but with the people. Put to them in a referendum, north and south in the one day. Just as the countries of Europe in joining Europe did the same. And that is crucially important because for the first time in our history, the people of Ireland have spoken as to how they wish to live together. And they have overwhelmingly endorsed that agreement. That, with that, the value of that is that no matter what conflict area you're in and you reach agreement, there's always going to be people who disagree and who are looking to overthrow it. Because you never get 100% anywhere. But what it does to those minority groups, it undermines them completely because they can no longer claim that they're acting in the name of the people. And if they keep on opposing, and even if they're trying to use violence to impose, they can be told clearly that they're fascists because they're seeking to impose their will in the people. And that strengthens the agreement enormously and weakens those groups. And as I say, those are the principles. And I, the question I am putting today is, are these principles that we could apply to other areas of conflict in the world? Let's look at Israel, the Middle East, and the Basque country. And let's say to them, and let them say to the people, look, let's forget about territory. This is not a quarrel about territory. This is about people, because even without people, without Palestinians and Israelis, without people, even this territory is only a jungle. So it's people, and it's how people live together on territory that's what the world is about. And therefore, it's agreement we need on how we share a piece of earth together. And let's agree, number one, that given that it's people that are divided, that violence has no role of any description to play in solving that problem, Anybody who wants to use it should be told repeatedly and publicly, you're making the problem worse. You're deepening the problem. You're making it far more difficult to understand. And we must respect difference because we could have been born in the other community. And if we were, we'd be shooting now our own community. And that's a very, well, that sounds a very simple thing to say. It's a very powerful thing to say on the streets, as I know from my own experience of facing gunmen. And as I say, that's a very strong point. And secondly then say, now that we have stopped the violence, let us now sit down and reach agreement on how we share this piece of earth together. And let's make sure that our agreement respects both identities and then creates the circumstances where we all work together for the real benefit of all our people on the socioeconomic front. And as we do that, the old quarrel will be eroded and do the same, say, in the Basque country. I believe those principles are, that are there have something really to offer. And I would look forward to the respected international leadership of the Nobel Committee in promoting those principles across the world. And of course, I hope too that the most influential country in the world, the United States, would use its influence and to remember again, to ask them to remember again the philosophy of their own founding fathers. Because when you think back to the foundation of the United States, it was founded by people driven from many countries in the world by intolerance, by deprivation, poverty, famine, etc. And their founding fathers decided that they were trying, going to build a country where that wouldn't happen anymore. And their philosophy of their founders, which I quote often when I'm speaking in America, is summed up in three words, which is written on the American scent. And if you can't read the scent, go to the grave of Abraham Lincoln, and there is that powerful message in three Latin words, e pluribus unum, from many we are one. The essence of our unity is respect for diversity, not fighting about it. And that is the philosophy of peace. And now as we enter the new century, 
we're also doing it at a time when the people of this world are living through the biggest revolution in the history of the world, the telecommunications, transport, and technological revolution, as a result of which the world is a much smaller place. People are much closer to one another than they ever were in history. And for that very reason, because we are, the message of real peace to that world is a pluribus unum. The essence of our unity is respect for diversity. And if we can create respect for diversity in that new world, in that new century, solutions for the 21st century, then we will be creating a world in which war and conflict will be left behind. And I think there is no more influential and highly respected international body in the world that can promote that philosophy than the Nobel Committee for Peace because of the respect that they have. And if they carry that, if in the second century now, in addition to rewarding peace, they also go to create peace, they will be really developing their powerful and positive role. And all of us will do everything we can to assist them. And thank you very much for having this day and this week. Thank you. Thank you.